Hey everybody, uh, it's December 11th and uh, I just want to do a quick tutorial video on how to read the charts that I tweet out. Um, this is a chart of QQQ on December the 9th. Uh, you'll see some filters over here on the right, you'll see trades on the left, trade clusters, the price information up here, volume below as you would normally see, and a volume profile over here on the right, and a, a legend up here in the top which describes everything. And I'll go through these uh, one at a time. Um, starting with this yellow highlighted box, um, by default when you load up a chart it's going to show you the three largest trades. Uh, this is configurable, of course. Uh, you can change this to 10 or 50 or all trades. This all trades option is only available, though, when you are looking at a single day. If you want to look at two days or a week or a month or whatever, 50 is the largest value that you can select. Uh, so if you want to quickly change this from 3 to 10, change the drop down, click repaint, it rebuilds the screen. You'll see 10 trades over here on the left instead of 3, and you'll see the 10 largest painted right there accordingly. Um, if we want to see all the trades, same idea. Um, and what we can tell now is that some trades over here in the left are highlighted in yellow and some are, are just in white. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are um, five times larger than average or greater. And the size is uh, here in parentheses 11x, 8.8x, and so on. Anything less than five is going to be in white. And this is just to draw attention to the ones that are the largest and that matter the most. Uh, we can also change the volume range. For example, if we only care about trades that are, uh, say, 500,000 shares or greater, we change that. We can filter out everything else, and we see that on this day, there are just two trades that came in at 500,000 or greater. One at 1.5 million, which is this guy here, and one at 750k. Um, switching this back to the three largest trades, um, I'll change this back to the default of 10,000 shares. The next thing we can talk about is uh, dark pools versus public trades, uh, or lit exchanges as you might otherwise hear. Um, dark pool trades are going to be in orange, and you can see there's a legend up here. And the lit exchange trades, or the public trades, the the trades that are placed on the exchanges that you and I use are going to be in blue. So this one was on the public exchanges. These are on dark pools. And if you wanted to look at just the dark pool trades, as some people do, you just change that option, repaint the screen, and you can see we've got the three largest selected and dark pool, dark pool selected, so we're going to get the three largest dark pool trades. But, you know, we could look at all of them if we like and see specifically where institutions are trading on dark pools. If you are not familiar with dark pools, uh, just Google it. Uh, it's it's basically a private exchange, and there are a number of reasons why institutions choose to trade on dark pools, but uh, for the purposes of this conversation, there are two primary reasons. Um, one is that it allows them to disguise what they're doing. Uh, by, by trading on a dark pool, <coughs> you get the um, advantage of being able to report it a little bit late. And secondly, it's so that they can transact large numbers of shares, millions of shares sometimes, without affecting price adversely. So um, when an institution wants to buy or sell a million shares of QQQ, if they just put a market order out there or a limit order out there, um, one, their order becomes visible. Uh, and two, the, as the order fills, it's going to change price. So this allows them to um, get their orders filled at, a, at the price that they want. And then once their order is filled, then they can report that transaction to the exchange. But one of the drawbacks for us is that they can report them a little bit late. And you can see here, there are two trades here that appear disconnected from price. So you've got price moving over here on the left price drops, and then a little bit later, after the fact, after price is all the way down here, these two transactions appear. And this is because institutions were able to report them after the fact. So this information would have been very useful, perhaps, if we had seen them come in when they were actually traded, then we could anticipate uh, what might be happening. But if price drops 
you know, two bucks into the close as it did that day. Uh, and then we find out after the fact that they sold it. Uh, that doesn't really help us much. So this is uh, an advantage that institutions have. If they can disguise what they're doing, they can trade in large quantities, and we don't always know until after the fact. And it's really easy to identify uh, late prints in some cases because of the fact that they're disconnected from price. You can see in this case there's this p-bar that comes up, and this doesn't mean that price shot up so that these guys could do this trade and then it came right back down. This is just the chart painting that in this minute of the day, uh, um, this amount of volume traded at this price. So it's it's a little bit misleading. Uh, price never did that. It was this was all done, you know, maybe an hour before we found out about it. Um, so if we wanted to look at just late prints, we can change this to late prints only, and we can see every time a late print arrived, and. Um, so we've got these two here, and then we've got a bunch clustered here and a few clustered here. Uh, late prints uh, take more than one form. We've got the ones I just discussed here, but anything that comes in pre-market or after-market is also uh, given a trade condition as late. So these are all 4 p.m. and beyond. These aren't late, late like these two are. These are just late because they're after uh, hours. Same with these three here. These all took place before the market opened, 8.30 in the morning. So, if we wanted to see just late prints, um, and there are scenarios where this is really important, then we can we can do that. But if we just want to see the ones that are on time, same idea. I uh, just want to see what's happening in real time here, and you can see this is where it was, what they were doing. And if I change this to Dark Bulls and Public, we'll get <clears throat> a mix of both. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is signature prints. Signature prints are special. They are um, dark pool prints, and they're late prints, and they are only specific to the indexes, SPY, QQQ, DIA, and IWM. And a signature print is special because it exploits a loophole in the rules for when and how institutions have to report their dark pool trades. Uh, in most cases, for every stock that aren't that aren't an index, um, they have to report them right away. Uh, I think the rule is 15 minutes. It might be an hour. I'm not sure it's really enforced because I see them come and go. But um, but the point is, um, they report them right away. But with signature prints, uh, the reason they're signature prints is twofold. Number one, they're always in the same size. And number two, they're traded in foreign exchanges. And when they trade on foreign exchanges, they are allowed to report them up to 24 hours later. So all of these trades here that are signature prints appear to have traded while price was in this zone or in this zone. But in reality, that's not true. These all took place the prior day. Uh, these happened uh, between the close in the after hours overnight sessions they happen happened on foreign exchanges and they are being reported late the reason it's important to know that these are signature prints and, and not a standard print is because this information is old and expired by the time we get it it's not nearly as useful as a print in real time would be so we can discount them or we can hide them and if we're looking at a chart and we're trying to figure out what's going to happen next we can say, say, just show me the standard prints. I don't care about the signature prints. I don't want to confuse myself into thinking that something is happening when it isn't, when it already happened yesterday, and when it, that information is, is old and a lot less useful. So when you suppress those and just look at the standard prints, you can see well, they all arrived right along where price traded. And these are more helpful because now I know that this very large trade up here um, well, A, it was on a lit exchange, and B, it was uh, not a signature print. Um, I get a lot of information about this, or this I find to be more helpful than a signature print is. And there are scenarios where I want to know where the signature prints are, but for the most part, um, I'm interested in what's happening right now, because price is more likely to respond to an event taking place right now than an event that took place uh, yesterday, for example. So this just allows us to isolate those. Um, sweeps and blocks 
Uh, the difference between a sweep and a block is similar to the difference between a limit order and a market order. Um, sweeps are like market orders. They suggest urgency. They, uh, they suggest that an institution wants in or wants out, and they don't care about getting the best price in their trade. They just want their trade filled. And <clears throat> sweeps are denoted with a diamond. So all these diamond-shaped trades here are sweeps. This can be helpful um, because you, you would expect price to respond more quickly to a sweep uh, rather than a block. And if it's a very large sweep, you would expect a really large magnitude move to, to begin right away. And you see these a lot of times in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the volatility ETFs, um, where they just spike it up um, and quickly just market sell everything they've got, and then volatility uh, collapses shortly after. But this will tell us effectively uh, about urgency. We can, of course, just look at blocks too. Blocks come in as circles, and so we can see that these are where the limit orders were. This big one up here was a limit order, and it took place on the public exchange, and this one um, was really important because it marked the high of the day, or it actually traded right as price was approaching the pre-market high here. But um, effectively, this guy was sitting up here waiting to be filled, uh, not disguised, not on a dark pool, not printed late, not uh, as an urgent market sweep, but rather just a big block trade sitting up there, and price traded up into him, he got his fill, and down, down price goes. Um, so blue is public, orange is dark pool, circles are blocks, diamonds are sweeps, and then we can customize um, whether we want to see the ones that are on time or late, uh, whether we want to see standard versus signature, and so on. Um, going down to the next one, we have this volume profile, complete or institution only. This is the volume profile, and by default it shows you the complete volume profile, which is all volume, whether it was institutional or not. This is every trade um, that anybody made throughout the day and the price at which they made it. So you can see that activity was concentrated up here and concentrated here, and then maybe a little bit here towards the close. This is a picture of what everyone was doing together. If we change this just to institutional, we can see that institutions act a lot differently. They did almost all of their business right here, right here as price was consolidating. They did a little bit up here, which basically translates to this big trade, and a little bit at the close. But most of the work that they did was right here. And this can be useful information because the institutional point of control you can see is here, whereas the point of control for the entire day for all traders was up here. So it tells you something different. It tells you the institutions are working hard right here. If we do all trades and do institutional only and do choose everything, we will see that we have all those signature prints from that again came in yesterday or were traded yesterday, came in today, influencing the shape of this profile. Uh, along with a lot of other trading that they did right here. You see some big trades here, here, and here. So this is just a, a different way to to isolate where uh, institutions are spending their time. Uh, so next I want to talk about the uh, trade clusters. Trade clusters are just groups of two or more trades at the same price within 10 cents of each other. And the five largest clusters on a given day are going to appear up here in the top left. Um, each cluster in this list corresponds to a, a blue line. Um, they, they are intended to show um, areas of support and resistance. Um, even if it's just a small cluster with two small trades, uh, a cluster is going to be tracked, but the five largest are going to appear at any point in time. So you can see this has 4.68 million shares, at 283.90, total of 19 trades, and that's this. Uh, that's where these signature prints are right here. That's this cluster. Uh, we've got another one, 1.5 million at 285.60, two trades. So that's up here. That's this big guy here, and then another one uh, 
know, wrong with this here. Um, and then so on, it goes on from there. But you can tell, uh, similar to a volume profile, you can tell where institutions are most active. And that helps us define areas uh, against areas against which we can define risk. Um, so I think that's it. We have the ability to, to change the number of trades we want to see, dark pools versus lit exchanges, sweeps versus blocks, late prints versus timely prints, standard prints versus signature prints. We can tweak the volume ranges to show any set of trades that we care about, whether they're small or large or somewhere in between. Uh, we can change the date range to go back as far as we like, although as of the time that I've made this video, uh, there are 15 years of data in here, so we can go back to 2007 if we want and show a um, show a chart with the 10 largest trades since QQQ began trading. And you'll see uh, a lot of my tweets have longer range charts because sometimes we want to see, you know, particularly when a very large trade comes in, well, when was the last time it came in? And if it was three years ago or five years ago or eight years ago, it might be useful to know. Um, so you can tweak that. This is a tool. This allows you to research more than just what's happening in any given day, but you can go back and look in the past and look for patterns and look for um, correlations and uh, try and, and help determine what's going to happen next, help anticipate price movements based on uh, all sorts of different factors here, including what's happened in the past. Um, and then lastly, you can hover over any of these and get a little bit of information. Uh, you can see that this is a block. It's got that orange icon next to it. You can see the date and the time when it was executed, the number of shares, the price, and then trade conditions. And these trade conditions, uh, I think there's about 60 or 70 different trade conditions. Um, this one says average price trade and form T. An average price trade just means that not every share in this block was traded at the same price, so they, they reported an average price of all the shares that were traded. And Form T just means late print, and I know it's a little bit cryptic, um, but um, I'll publish the uh, trade conditions at some point on the website so that they can be more easily followed. Um, in the meantime, I get all this data from Polygon.io, and you can Google trade conditions Polygon.io, and you can see a list of the different conditions and what they mean. Um, sometimes there's useful information here about whether or not a trade was contingent or whether or not it was uh, an average price, whether it was late or on time, whether it was a sweep or a block. Uh, there's a handful of other scenarios that I care about. Um, but anyway, hover over any of these and you can find out more about the trade. Try and determine what's, what's going on. And of course, sometimes there are no conditions at all, as you can see in this one. This is just a standard Dark pool trade, 25,000 shares, nothing attached to it. Um, anyhow, that's it. Uh, questions, send me an email, info at volumeleaders.com, or find me on Twitter, send me a DM. DMs are always open. Ask questions if you have them. I'm here to help. Um, that's it, guys. Thanks for your time.